39 years that my wife and I have been here, we don't think about what's today. We're concerned about the future. We're concerned about decades. If, if, the, if the now mattered most, Jesus would not have died. He died because the future matters. There's an awful lot of things we do um, just because the future matters. And uh, anyway, I think if the future really mattered, you'd eat better. But I'm not going <laughs> to. All right, Matthew chapter 2. Let's stand just to stretch our legs for a moment. And if you're going to need to slip out, this will be a good, I'll read a few verses, pray, and we'll be right in Matthew in these next six or eight chapters. And it won't be long today, uh, but look with me at uh, Matthew chapter 2. And I'm going to skip, these are familiar verses, the Christmas story, we would call it. Verse 1, now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. And when Herod... The king had heard these things. He was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. Now, the reason he was troubled is he didn't like this idea of a king. He wanted no competition. You know, it's like the, the girl in high school, her old boyfriend moves back, and uh, that's a problem. And so um, and we'll just read a verse or two more. Verse 4, and when he had gathered the chief priests and scribes and the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said to him in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written in the prophet, Thou, thou Bethlehem, in the land of Judah art not the least among the princes of Judah, yet for out of thee shall come a governor, hit to rule my people Israel. And then uh, Herod basically says to them, go find him, tell me where he is, because I want to come and worship him. And then God warned him, he didn't, he wanted to kill him. And so look over to verse 12. And being warned of a God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they, that's the wise men, they departed unto their own country another way. And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and be there until I bring thee word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. And in verse 16, when Herod saw that he was mocked of the wise men, he was exceeding wroth, and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem, and in all the coasts thereof from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. And there's a whole lot of grief that comes in there. And let's pray. Help us today. Direct my thoughts. Uh, we're busy people, too busy in our country like this. And we don't have enough time. We ought, to, we ought to sit for hours talking over this book. But we have just these few minutes. And so I pray you'd give us something that would help us. And that during the week we'd pick it up often. And that it would be our friend and our guide. And that it would be... Uh, the, the thing that leads our families as well, Lord, help us in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Look with me at these verses. Um, this morning I'm speaking on evil versus good. Evil versus good. And, and um, a couple of, maybe a month ago, I talked a little bit at the, on this subject. And a couple months before, there's a lot of evil in the world. And, and if you're not careful, you'll get thinking that evil wins. You'll get thinking that, um, you know, if the elections go my way, then God's in control. And if they don't, then God's not in control. Can I tell you, God's in control. And uh, God could have Mickey Mouse get elected for president. And, um, and it is so funny, and not to be critical, I am very patriotic. I love our country. I love our military. And, and, uh, and yet, do you know God was intimately involved in people for about 5,000 years before there was an America? Do you know that for a long time, nobody cared about America? And yes, there's been some good done in recent years, in the last 150 years or so. But the sun does not rise and set on destinies and eternity uh, on what happens here. If there's mercy, and by the way, we need mercy. If in God's mercy, he would preserve us then we could continue to be a blessing to the world. But if God wants to take Mexico or the Philippines or, or uh, Thailand and make them the springboard of good to the world, God's not limited geographically, numerically, or racially. God can do whatever he wants, however he wants, with whomever he wants. He's God. So the big thing is we need him. Don't get thinking he needs us. I'll show God. I'm going to quit on him. Oh, that'll really break his heart. He's got 7 billion others right now, not counting those that live for the last 6,000 years. Not that he doesn't love you, but you're really not that big a fish in the pond. It's we who need him. 
It's we who ought to long for him. Now, evil, I just want to take some time and show you a few scenarios today. Uh, uh, maybe a pretty unusual sermon this morning, but I want you to notice in verse 16 of Matthew chapter 2, we're just going to run through the first dozen or so chapters in Matthew and pick a few verses. Herod in verse 16, this is the, this is the political leader, and he is mad because he didn't get his way. Could you imagine a political leader getting mad because they didn't get their way? Can't even imagine that. Anyway, he got mad. Um, he was exceeding, in verse 16, he was exceeding wroth. And, and he was so mad, he decided, I was looking for that other microphone. He was, uh, he was so mad, he killed all the kids two years old and under. Can you imagine anybody so evil they'd kill babies? Can you imagine voting for someone that would kill babies? What, a, what craziness that is. And I've heard people try to justify this and that. I think, you know what? I don't even think you ought to kill the bad people. Well, maybe some of them. <laughs> the death penalty is in the scriptures. And, uh, but man, there ought to be a love for life and a love for people. And, and so there in verse 16, he was exceeding raw. So we're going to start out the life of our Savior with evil looking like it won. And Joseph and Mary and Jesus fled the country and go to Egypt. Now, now he's an immigrant, foreign land, don't know anybody, don't have any family. Where's grandpa and grandma? Who's going to give him a Christmas present? Think there was Christmas yet? Maybe not. <laughs> All these kids die. Look down, if you would, at verse... It's the fulfillment of the prophecy in Jeremiah. Look at verse 18. In Ramah, there was a, vo a voice heard, lamentation and weeping and great mourning. Rachel weeping for her children and would not be comforted because they're not. And tragedy. And it prophesied all the way back to the days of Jeremiah, this tragic hour. And understand this. For every tragedy you see, there is a God who ahead of time knew what was going on and had a plan. And though this moment in Matthew 2 looked tragic, clear back hundreds of years before in the life of Jeremiah, God looked ahead and saw the tragedy. God knew it was going to happen. God wrote about it, had Jeremiah write about it, and God's in control of this thing. Don't think evil is in control. There is a real, living, uh, horrible creature. Evil is not I made a mistake. There is an evil that's destructive and hateful and ruinous and wants to ruin anything that's good and anything that's God and missionaries thrown in jail and prison and, and uh, godly families broken up and churches destroyed. Don't think God's not in that. That's crazy. God wins. God wins everything. So you go down a little bit further. To, let's just skip over to chapter 4. And from the beginning of our Savior's life, evil was, was circling like a, a carnivorous bird looking for a chance to destroy. Um, Matthew chapter 4 begins the Lord's ministry. He's baptized at the end of chapter 3, which, by the way, once you've been saved, the next thing you ought to do is get baptized by immersion. And that's the that's a Bible command of God. He gets baptized. Chapter 4, verse 1, he's led of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And so right off the bat, there's temptation and there's pressure and, uh, and there's uh, uh, hunger. Forty days he's without. Let's read there. Verse 2, and when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward a hungered. And the tempter came, and so he's, he's challenging his deity, he's challenging his power, he's challenging his abilities, and each time Jesus is quoting Bible, and you'll see over and over, when evil is around, the, the answer is always God's word. And God is our victory, God is our strength. If you're discouraged and you're, you're feeling just down and discouraged, and again, there may be some biological reason, you know, uh, like you just had a baby and you, know, you, had, you just had your seventh baby in six years, that's a reason to be discouraged. But, uh, but uh, that's a reason for everybody to pray for one. All the moms who had a baby in the last 18 months need prayed for. Just simple as they say, why? Because, and they, their husbands need prayed for. And... Uh, and then there's a God in heaven who has scripture to help you and scripture to comfort you and scripture to encourage you. And you teenagers, I, I wish you could grab it. When my wife was about 15, 16 years old, she got a hold of that book as it was her book. 
and it became a hers. And she became a student of the Word of God in her middle high school, sophomore, junior year, about her junior year. Some things happened in her life and just, just clicked, a, turned a corner spiritually. For me, I got saved at 18, and I picked that book up and said, this is my book, that till death do us part. It's my book. And uh, it became, and I'll tell you, no matter what evil throw, evil is thrown at you, no matter what evil throws at you, uh, the, the actual person of evil and the personification of evil, the word of God is your answer. The word of God is your comfort. The word of God is your strength. And God knows. Nothing can enter your life or my life today that God's there already. You know, God knows what's going on in our country. I'm excited about the future. I'll tell you, never in my life has there ever been a time when anything was global. Short of breathing and eating. But in a matter of weeks, just weeks, people that didn't even wear, people still in loincloths were wearing masks. <laughs> like, man, God is awesome. You say, oh, the devil's in control. Oh, get up, bro. He's not in. The devil's got no clue what's going on. But I've read enough of this book to know the king is coming. The king is coming. Uh, I'd sing it for you, but anyway. Uh, he's, he's on his way. Jesus, and somebody said, yeah, he's coming. He's really mad. <laughs> but you look there at Matthew 4.4. 4. Um, Jesus answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. God, is, God has given us his word to counteract evil and to control evil. Brother, Brother Esposito mentioned it when he, in the adult Sunday school that uh, when trials come and difficulties come, we get down, we get very introspective, and, and uh, we get worried about us. No, you're supposed to lift up your eyes and say, what do you want me to do now, God? There's something to do. And, and you're not bad that you get discouraged. Jeremiah sat in a, a dungeon underneath the, the uh, palace and in, in literally in a sewer, and he said, I'm done, God. You're stronger than me. You're more powerful than me. But I just want you to know, I'm done. I quit. And that, there's no telling how long that went on. Could have been five minutes. Could have been five hours. Could have been five days. But after a while, he said, well, maybe I'll preach still. And he said, his word was in my heart as a burning fire and I could not contain. You see, because he had put enough scripture into his heart when all the, I mean, the worst of the worst that could happen to a guy. We don't know of one convert Jeremiah ever had. It was Jeremiah's ministry was probably one of the worst things that ever any preacher's ever faced. And yet he lifted up his eyes and he said, I can't, this, this book, it's, it's burning in my soul. I've, I've got to go do it. I've got to go do it. And then along came a servant, dropped some rags down, said, put these under your arms. I'll pull you out and just stay six feet away when you get out of here because you stink, man. And... <laughs> And so look down there at verse 11, 40 days. We're in chapter 4, verse 11. After 40 days in the temptation, um, then the devil leaveth him, and behold, the angels came and ministered to him. Don't think because you are literally uh, sh shredded by the difficulties of life. Don't think God doesn't know where you are. He stood over here and watched his own son go through such traumatic things that Jesus needed angels to literally come and minister to him. But God had a plan, and Jesus wins this thing. Everything, look, just because there's battles. Now, Adonai Judson sat in jail for a year, and his wife scrapped around and scraped and scrapped and tried to find food to keep him alive. And by the time Adonai Judson got out, she died. Tragedy. I guess for the last couple hundred years, they've been walking around golden streets. And, of course, he had three wives. I wonder which one he's going to have in the resurrection. But <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. We won't go there. I've had way too much reading this week. And <laughs> go to verse 12. I mean, Jesus gets ministered to. He leaves the wilderness. Verse 12. Now, when Jesus heard that John was cast into prison, he departed from Galilee. Here his cousin, John the Baptist, thrown in jail and um, thrown in jail for preaching, thrown in jail for meddling in the, the, the governor's moral life, saying, you can't marry that woman. That ain't right. And pointed his long old Baptist finger in that guy's nose. Look at verse 14. Um, I'm sorry, verse 13. And leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the seacoast in the border of Zebulun and Naphtali, 
that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Esaias the prophet, saying the land of Zebulun. Now, wait a minute. You know what happened? Jesus is tempted, 40 days fasting, tragic, physical, uh, everything physically that could go wrong, wrong. The devil's temptations on him. God knows exactly what's going on. God sends the angels to minister him to him. He comes out of the wilderness, and he hears John's in prison. He goes over to the coast, and... Uh, and uh, heart uh, concerned about John, he goes over, and you know what he's doing? He's fulfilling Scripture as it is written. You know, God knows exactly where you are and where you're going and what you're having to face. And, and as with Brother Esposito said last hour, he was planning on coming home just for a couple of months to visit some churches, raise some money or do whatever, you see the grandkids, get back to Laos and, and get involved in the ministry again, and he has to leave early. Now he's stuck here. Hey, God knows where we are. God's ordering our path. And, and here Jesus comes right out of the wilderness and gets over to Capernaum, and God has led him exactly where he's supposed to go. And you probably missed the whole thing, so let's go back and look at it again in verse 14. That it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Esaias the prophet, saying the land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali, the, by the way of the sea, beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people that sat in darkness saw great light. God was guiding our Lord, though it was dark, Though it was an evil day, though there was a godless government, though there was wrong all around him, God knows where he wants his people to be. Amen. Go down to verse, uh, let's go to chapter 5. Chapter 5, we'll just skip over a little bit here, down to verse 44. If we'd read our Bible enough, we wouldn't be surprised. You say, people are mean to me. Yeah, Jesus was despised and rejected. We esteemed him not. Uh, Matthew chapter 5, look at verse 44. Jesus said, uh, but I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you and pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you. I had a guy tell me a couple of years ago, it was a brilliant scriptural insight. He said, you know what you need? Look at that verse. He says in verse 44, but I say unto you, love your enemies. He said, you know what you need in order to fulfill that verse? I was looking for some deep, profound thought. He said, enemies. Oh, there you go. You get that? You can't live that verse if somebody doesn't hate you. Look at it. Look what it says. Do good. Bless them that curse you. You can't fulfill that verse if somebody doesn't cuss you. Do good to them that hate you. You can't fulfill that commandment of God unless somebody hates you. We want to have this. We want this hallmark Winnie the Pooh, 40-acre wood lifestyle where everybody's nice and even the heffalumps and woozles are nice when we get to know them. Sometimes you got to sit and look around our church and, and classify people on poo. Really, it's fun. Oh, yeah, that's a tigger, that's for sure. And that's a gopher, and that's a rabbit. <laughs> you know, rabbit, that's the grump. <laughs> Got it all together, but, but, but no fun at all. And uh, that's Christopher Robin. Everything's okay, and you only see him from the knees down. <laughs> uh, so I've done it with our staff. I think it's great. If you staff members want to know where you are, just you know. <laughs> so Jesus is saying, Jesus says, look, you're going to, you're going to have enemies. You're going to have people hate you. That is what you are a light in a world of darkness. Your life in a world of death. Your hope in a world that's hopeless. The world doesn't like that. And so people are going to be on you. But don't think evil wins. Go over to chapter 8. See, every evil brings a moment for light to shine. Evil doesn't win. Now, if you hate those who hate you, now you're giving evil a chance to win. You despise those who despise you. Now you're giving evil a chance to win. Greatest, the greatest victory you can have and I can have over evil is when we just keep loving people and serving God and doing right. You know, want to want to throw them in the prison like they did the Apostle Paul? He'll just win people to Christ in prison. Amen. You know, picture this. I'm not, I'm not going to get out of Matthew the first few chapters here, but picture this. You want to go into the book of Acts. The Apostle Paul is arrested and thrown in jail. And I'm sure the devil's thinking, well, that'll fix him. He's out there starting churches and getting people saved by the thousands and preaching on the street. We're going to fix him. We'll get him arrested and thrown in jail. Paul walks out with a third of the New Testament written and converts from every jail cell he was in. 
Lift, that's that lift up your eyes, Brother Esposito was talking about. Look, look, evil cannot win when God is there. God's in charge. Now, it may look bad, and I'm sure the Apostle Paul wasn't going to jail thinking, man, this is going to be awesome. Wonder what great thing is going to happen in this prison. You know, can you see the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego saying, this is going to be really cool, you guys. I mean, when they throw us into that fire, you wait. This is going to be awesome. No, they were screaming. <laughs> How do you know? Because I know Baptists. <laughs> of course they were panicked. All right, let's go over to chapter 8, Matthew 8, verse 1. And there's so many of these stories, but let's look at some things that, uh, that we call tragedies. In Matthew 8, there's a lot of tragedies. When he was come down from the mountain, a great multitude followed him. And behold, there came a leper and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. Now, we're assuming this is an adult. So somewhere in this young man's life he contracted leprosy if you don't understand leprosy leprosy you can't live in the same house with the rest of your family you can't stand any you got to stand within six feet of people and you got to stand in the little circles in the stores <laughs> you literally had to cover your mouth and wherever there are leprous sores there were rags that hung around the city that's what i've read and you you wiped the dripping sores so it wouldn't get around the city back in Isaiah 64 where it says all of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags that's those rags that hung around the city where they wiped that oozing leprous infected sores and the leper had to cry out as they went around town unclean unclean could never hold a child their own children never embrace their own spouse for however long he had leprosy, you talk about darkness. You talk about evil. Horrible, horrible disease that God called a picture of sin tip in, his, in types. And, and there's this tragedy. Then along comes Jesus in verse 2. And behold, the leper came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And Jesus put forth a hand and touched him, saying, I will be thou clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And, and the, the cure was right there, but... The darkness came along, but there couldn't be glory. See, the key in everything you and I face is keep Jesus right in the middle of everything. We've got to keep him there. The answer is never to go long without drawing near to the one who can be glorified. Remember the guy, we won't go there in the Gospel of John. He was born blind. Here he is all his life blind. And, and, um, and his, the disciples said, he's begging, he's an adult now. And the disciples said, who sinned, him or his parents that he was born blind? Jesus said, neither of them sinned. This is for the glory of God. This is all about God getting glorified. And here we are in our darkness, and it looks like evil's winning. But I can tell you something. If we will yield our lives to God, there is a God in heaven who will bring glory into that situation and will be honored in that situation and will be lifted up. And it's our job. That's, look, Romans 8, 28, all things work together for good to them that love God. Then maybe all things don't work together for good to those that don't love God. The dead were raised. We can read through this chapter. The sick were healed. The crippled were made well. The blind see. Go over to chapter 10. In every tragedy in life, as you read through the Gospels, Matthew as much as it, or more than the others, Matthew chapter 10, but all the, the health and the burdens and the death, and it's the widow whose only son has died, and Jesus comes and raised him from the dead and, and gives the, girl, the, the widow back her son. And every tragedy... God comes in and brings good and glory. Evil doesn't win, folks. Evil does not win. I've heard people say, oh, I'm, I'm, I just, it's hopeless. There's no hope for America. Jesus is the hope. He's the hope of the world. If you think the hope of America is in the White House, you've, you've, you've been deceived. And the hope is of America is in the church house. And what's really sad, we'll be in Matthew 10 in a minute, we've got way too many Christians who are thinking if we get the church right, then we can have conservatives in politics and God's goal is not a conservative America God's goal is a godly America that's the goal you know what I think if we just need to be right with God and seek God and, and long for holiness in our lives so God will give us good jobs and good houses and <laughs> And all the liberals will swim halfway to Hawaii. <laughs> and what happens then? They stop swimming. 
buy them all one-way tickets to Baghdad. We somehow, we're all this way. You know, so we'll have children born and the labor will be 10 minutes and it won't be painful. And, you know, we'll be able to retire at 50 and have lots of money in the bank and pensions and rich people will leave us their wealth. And that's what we think God is. When have you ever seen that in the history of the world? I'll tell you, the greatest Christian that ever lived, the greatest dozen Christians that ever lived were killed and chased slandered, murdered, and they turned the world upside down. Uh, I tell you, I'm excited. If, if things get better in America, socially, politically, morally, educationally, I'm, I'm happy. If they get worse, the light's going to shine brighter. And some of you are going to learn about secret eye soul winning. I, you say, I'm trying to, I, I can't get into college. The colleges are all closed. Well, that's all right. You're probably going to die before you're 25 anyhow. Who cares about the quality of your education when you're going to be murdered for your faith? (laughs) Let's go preach and witness. Now, it may not come to that in America, but it was that way for a thousand years in the world across Europe. All right, you in Matthew 10 yet? I was waiting for the deacons to find the 10. That's a one and a zero after it. Look at verse 16. More difficulties. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. That's promising. Isn't that great? I tell you what we need. We need a good second amendment, and we need to shoot them wolves. <laughs> Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents, harmless as doves, but beware of men. He says there's going to be some bad people around. There are. You know, don't get thinking as long as we're good, everybody's going to be good. That only works on Winnie the Pooh. And half the Hallmark shows. Hallmark. Anyway. Don't go there. Beware of men. They will deliver you up to councils. Look at verse 18. You shall be brought before governors and kings. You're going to have political problems. They're going to deliver you. You're going to be, verse verse 19, when they deliver you up, take no thought what you shall speak. God will give you an answer what to say. Look down at verse 22. You shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. He that endureth to the end shall be saved. We've got a God who's so powerful. Look over to verse 31, 30 and 31. Same chapter, chapter 10, verse 30. The very hairs of your head are all numbered, even Brother Esposito's head. (laughs) Verse 31, fear not ye therefore. Ye are of more value than many sparrows. And you might be in that situation that just seems evil and wrong and hurtful and difficult. And God says, I know the hairs on your head. And every bird that falls, I was walking across the grass early this morning. There were feathers all over the grass. And I thought, someone fulfilled their purpose in life. (laughs) One of the neighborhood cats got something. And uh, but when that bird fell over there on that grass, it didn't fall. It was caught. Um, God knew. And if God knew that dumb little bird, don't you think he knows about you? And he says, look, relax. Relax. I'm going to take care of you. Everything's all right. You're going to be hated. You're going to have some problems. Go over to chapter 11, verse 28. He goes, he's in, in, and I'm skipping lots in here. If you want to read through these chapters, you'll see burden and trials and heartaches and difficulties. And, and Jesus in verse 28 says, come unto me. Just come to me. All ye that labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I'm meek and lowly of heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. He says, come on. I know demon possessions and, and hatred and, and violence and jail and anger and wolves uh, 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 you're the sheep among the wolves. He said, just come, just come real close here. And I will take care of you. Go over to chapter 13. You see, it's the end of the story that really matters. Look at chapter 13, verse 24. Another parable put he forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened to a man which sowed good seed in the field, and while enemies slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat. And went his way. And when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. And 
And basically, here's a guy over here trying to do right, and he's done, the, he's done it right, and he's plowed his fields. It's a picture of people, by the way. And, uh, and he's done right in his fields and planted good seed and got the weeds out and got everything prepared. And he went, and while he was asleep, a bad guy came along and sowed bad seed among the good seed. And up came the good, uh, the good wheat, and up came the tares that caused all kinds of grief. And you might think, oh, here I'm trying to do right in the world. And then this, this evil gets sown around me on my job or in the neighborhood, whatever it is. God knows what's going on. God knows what's going on. Just look, look at the passage here. He says, um, go down to, to verse, um, verse 24. I'm sorry, verse 25, verse 26, there we go. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, he appeared, then appeared the tares. So the servants, the householder, came and said, Sir, everything is falling apart. Verse 28, he said, An enemy hath done this. And could you just accept the fact there's enemies? God, let me encourage you today. Your world isn't coming to an end because there's an enemy. He told us there'd be enemies. He promised us there's an adversary walking about seeking whom may devour. There, there's bad in this world, but the bad doesn't win. Everything's going to be all right. So we go down a little bit further there, wherever we were just a minute ago. Um, I lost my place here. Go, go over to chapter, um, chapter 13, and uh, let's go to verse 28. Uh, he said, An enemy hath done this. And the servant said to him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? And listen to what he said. This is great. When he said, Nay. Lest while you gather up the tares, root up also the wheat with them. Let them both grow, both grow together. Jesus said, the good seed is going to be okay. You get that? There's all the good seed. And an enemy sows some bad seed among it. And they both grow up. And he says, don't you fret. You'll be okay. You'll be fine you'll be fine. It's going to be all right. And then, I love this word, the story ends. Remember I said in a minute ago, the end is what counts. He, he said, let them both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I'll say to the reapers, gather first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them. That's a good thing, isn't it? And gather the wheat into my barn. Do you know there's a day coming? Child of God, you're in this world and the, and the tares have been sowed around you. And sometimes you think, man, it's just a dirty world. It's a corrupt world. It's a, it's a yucky world. And, and you think, how do I get out of this? You will. And one day the Lord's going to come along and say, come on. He's got a place prepared for you. And he's got a pre place prepared for the unsaved. He's got, he's got security and comfort for you. And he's got judgment and wrath for the lost. Now, as a child of God... Look, look at chapter 13, verse, verse 43. Let me show you one more, and I'll close. There's so much more here, but just look at verse 43. Chapter 13, verse 43. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Anybody listening? That's what he means when he says, who hath ears to hear? Hello? Anybody listening? Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Now, I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow in my health or my home or my country or global whatever's going on. But I do know there's a kingdom coming. And the righteous shall shine forth as the sun in the kingdom. That's what you need to focus on. Evil does not win. You, I, I don't think anybody reads Revelation enough. You get to the end of Revelation, the devil's thrown into a bottomless pit Angels lock him in there for a thousand years. At the end of the thousand years, they open the pit, let him out, and for one big last hurrah, and then he's cast into a lake of fire forever and ever, a new heaven, new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. You know what, folks? We win. Evil doesn't win. There's some skirmishes. I saw, I saw the other day, forget where it was, I saw a UFC fight, and I don't know if it's current or old, but it doesn't matter. If guys are getting beat up, it's good. And... Uh, and this guy got beat up pretty bad. He was bleeding here and here and there. And, and, uh, and then the, the fight ended, and, and the guy who obviously lost went over and gave a big hug to the other guy. And I thought, I couldn't do that. You beat me that bad. I'm going to kick you somewhere. I'm going to do that. 
But at the end of the fight, you may feel like you've been beat up. But the guy who won, he was pretty beat up too. This is an ugly old world. It is young people. Don't let evil bother you. Let me tell you, young people, go to school if you want to. Get a job. Marry a godly Christian. Stay clean. Have some kids. Stay in Sunday school. Smooch a lot. Get old and smooch a lot. And uh, have your teeth fall out and gum a lot. <laughs> and then you're entering into the kingdom. Don't fret. Don't, don't let this world get you down. Everything's going to be okay. And every time there's a trial, you read the scriptures, God shows up with good, God's word shows up with comfort, and then God promises everything's going to be fine. Uh, we, we serve a great God. Just let's have a good day. I encourage you, go eat ice cream. Now, if you're not saved, you have reason to be worried. If you're not saved, I want to encourage you, trust Christ. Let us tell you about it. Let's pray together. Lord, help us.